colleagues. I'm I just want to, before opening the meeting, uh, and I will not open the meeting right now, but just to explain a little bit what is happening. We have a problem because we have one speaker only, and uh, what would happen theoretically, we could have this one speaker, and if there is no speaker afterwards, the debate would be closed. The discussion would be over, and everyone else would have lost the possibility to speak. So in order to prevent this, I am now not opening the meeting. But I would encourage you all, please, to ensure. I mean, I know that there are very, very important meetings happening, going on, etc. But at the end of the day, for those of us who are here and who are ready to start, I think it is a question of courtesy to try to ensure that speakers who are on the list are physically present. So I would really encourage you and, and ask you for your support here in trying to get uh, speakers into the room. Thank you. We're going to continue waiting now for speakers to arrive. Thank you, colleagues. We've now received some good news and some more speakers. Um, and so I hereby call the 26th meeting of the third committee at the 78th session of the General Assembly to order. I invite the committee to continue its consideration of agenda item 71 entitled Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and sub items A to D. The list of speakers under the general discussion of this item is closed and the deadline for submission of draft proposals under the item is at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, 31st of October. I now invite the committee to continue its general discussion on the agenda item. Before I give the floor to the first speaker, I just want to remind you again that the time limit for individual delegations is five minutes for groups, eight minutes. To assist you in managing time, you will again see a timer visible on the large screen in the room and the digits will turn red one minute before the expiration of the time limit and the microphones will be switched off when the time is up. I now give the floor to the first speaker on the list, and that is Israel. You have the floor. Thank you, Honorable Chair. My name is Mo, and I'm Israel's youth delegate. I would like to start this statement with sharing a piece of my personal story. Between 2018 and 2021, I lived in the Kerem Shalom Kibbutz, one of many Israeli communities in the vicinity of Gaza Strip. The definition of Kerem Shalom in Hebrew means garden of peace, and my purpose in living there was to help the kibbutz build a diverse and unique community, notwithstanding the security challenges Israel is facing in that area. My bedroom was in a bomb shelter. This was due to the very short distance from Gaza, 
which only enabled the citizens of that community a few seconds to find a cover when sirens went off in a situation of indiscriminate rocket shelling, rocket shelling from Gaza. This has been the situation for many of these communities for the past 18 years since Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip. And yet, I chose to live in this amazing place with this amazing community, despite the danger, because life continues. And I believe life should not be dictated by terror. This is what also guided most of the people living there. They chose life, not terror. But on October 7th, while celebrating the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, terror chose them with a message of hate and fear. This warm community, a once called home, suffered a heinous attack, as did other neighboring communities. The terrorists of Hamas came with arms, guns, grenades, purposely killing and wounding families, and abducting over 200 Israelis. Hamas is responsible for killing families and brutalizing individuals, kidnapping innocent citizens without any distinction or mercy, without any single shred of humanity. This horror against innocent men, women, the elderly, children, girls, babies, persons with disabilities, is more than words can describe and more than the soul can bear. This year, we mark the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. Section 17 on the, on the declaration states, quote, the acts, methods, and practices of terrorism in all its forms are activities aimed at the destruction of human rights, fundamental freedoms and democracy, threatening territorial in, in tragedy, security of states, and destabilizing legitimacy constitute government, end quote. It is important to us to, it, it is important for us to make it clear. Israel is in a war again, against a terror organization called Hamas. Not citizens, not individuals. Hamas is holding 200 kidnapped persons, many of them in need of medical treatment and medication. They are being held there with their most basic rights denied, in absolute contradiction to international law, and in a manner that places their lives in extreme danger. Noya, a 13 year old girl with autism, is one of the kidnapped Israeli citizens taken by Hamas. 11 days have passed since she was abducted, and we, ha and we have no information about her situation. Are her basic needs met? Are her human rights protected? Section 17 in the Vienna Declaration continues by saying, quote, the international community should take the necessary step to enhance cooperation to prevent and combat terrorism, end quote. Honorable Chair, I ask the global community to help us against terrorism. The only message that, do, should, that should come out right now is a clear and unequivocal condemnation of a terrorist organization, Hamas, a demand for the immediate release of all Israeli hostages held in Gaza, and a strong support to Israel's rights to defend its citizens. Anything else rather than that plays to the hands of Hamas and harms the fights against terrorism. Any act of politicization using disinformation and refinement of the acts by Hamas distance any sort of resolution of this situation. You cannot comprehend the magnitudes of this situation sitting comfortably in this room. You cannot try to digest the ruthless inhumanity. You cannot comprehend the devastation, the brutality, the testimonies of survivors of rape, of children teared from the arms of their mothers, of entire families slaughters, slaughtered and gone. What you can do is not tolerate it. What you should do is condemn terror unequivocally, condemn Hamas, a genocidal jihadist terror organization, and stand with the right of peace, seeking democracies, defending their civilians. Israel is at the front for, forefront of the war on terror. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Israel and give the floor to the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the honor of delivering this cross-regional joint statement on behalf of the following 51 countries. Albania, Andorra, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Canada, Croatia, Czechia, Denmark, Estonia, Eswatini, Fiji, Finland, France, Germany, Guatemala, Iceland, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Latvia, Liberia, Liechtenstein, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Moldova, Monaco, Montenegro, Nauru, 
the Netherlands, New Zealand, North Macedonia, Norway, Palau, Paraguay, Poland, Portugal, Republic of the Marshall Islands, Romania, San Marino, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Tuvalu, Ukraine, the United States, and my own country, the United Kingdom. Members of Uyghur and other predominantly Muslim minorities in Xinjiang continue to suffer serious violations of their human rights by the authorities of the People's Republic of China. The UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, relied extensively on China's own records when it published its Assessment of Human Rights Concerns in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. This independent and authoritative assessment found evidence of large-scale arbitrary detention and systemic use of invasive surveillance on the basis of religion and ethnicity. Severe and undue restrictions to legitimate cultural and religious practices, identity and expression, including reports of, destructive, of destruction of religious sites. Torture, ill treatment, and sexual and gender-based violence, including forced abortion and sterilization. Enforced disappearances and family separations and forced labor. The assessment concluded that the arbitrary and discriminatory detention of members of Uyghur and other predominantly Muslim minorities on a large scale in Xinjiang, and I quote, may constitute international crimes, in particular, crimes against humanity. Over a year has passed since that assessment was released, and yet China has not engaged in any constructive discussion of these findings. Last month, at the 54th session of the Human Rights Council, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, called on China to follow the recommendations of the assessment and take, and I quote, strong remedial action. So far, we have not seen evidence of China taking any such action. We urge China to end its violations of human rights in Xinjiang, engage constructively with the OHCHR, and fully implement the recommendations of the assessment. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom on behalf of a group of countries. I now give the floor to Oman on behalf of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Mr. Chair, shared delegates, to begin with, I have the honor to give this statement on behalf of the member countries of the GCC, which are the United Arab Emirates, the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the State of Qatar, the State of Kuwait, and my own country, the Sultanate of Oman. The countries uh, joining together in this statement believe that human rights is one of the main causes uh, which attract a lot of attention, especially under the increase of wars, uh, epidemics and conflicts and all kinds of practices uh, violating international norms, the increase of xenophobia and uh, hatred between people of different beliefs. The countries of the GCC would like to reaffirm the utmost commit commitment to reinforce and promote the principles of human rights everywhere and in line with the international instrument and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to safeguard the principles enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, including equal sovereignty, sovereignty for member countries in the organization. Our countries reaffirm the importance of discussing issues of human rights in the United Nations in objectively, constructively, and in all transparency with no politicization and respecting the sovereignty of countries and not interfering with internal affairs and to be in line with the principles enshrined in the Charter of the UN as well as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mr. Chair, 
The countries of the GCC reaffirm the rights of every country to development, eradicate poverty, ignorance, and illness being among the most important human rights. We reaffirm the rights of every country to fight terrorism, protect the peace and security of their countries. Yet the terrorism has no religion and no ethnicity. It is something that we need to fight all uh, of us. And fighting terrorism does not free any country from its obligations under the international human rights instruments and international law, including the principles of non-discrimination, proportionality, and due diligence. We call upon all countries and regional groups to take pre proactive steps to dialogue and discuss matters of human rights. Since Dialogue and listening to different viewpoints is the most effective approach to reach positive results that would help us treat the root causes of any uh, difference in viewpoints. In conclusion, we are working in the UN to achieve consensus on matters of human rights. We must all and while looking at any item of an agenda to take note of the specificity on the ground and to have reliable sources of information. This should also be done in respect of different cultures and religions in our societies and to uh, participate constructively, safeguard the mutual respect, build trust and reinforce uh, international cooperation on human rights matters. The constructive dialogue is the basis of stability and understanding between peoples, and this is in all domains. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Oman and give the floor to Egypt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, this statement was prepared for yesterday and it remains valid for today. Egypt condemns in the strongest terms the bombing by Israel of the Ahli Baptist Hospital in Gaza City, killing at least 500 people in a grave violation of international law and international humanitarian law, and in a series of acts that may amount to crimes against humanity in contravention with international law and the Fourth Geneva Convention. This happens while we were and still are seated here in this room glorifying the importance of the promotion and protection of human rights, oblivious of the ongoing persistent and systemic violation of the human rights of Palestinian people under occupation. Israel must immediately stop its collective punishment of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. It must halt shelling the surroundings of the Rafah border crossing to enable Egypt to facilitate the access and delivery of humanitarian assistance to the Palestinians under siege in Gaza. Egypt categorically rejects and objects to attempts to enforce the displacement of Palestinians to neighboring countries in contravention with the right to self-determination and right of return. In a related context, we are deeply concerned about the limitations in some countries which champion democracy on the exercise of the right to freedom of expression as well as in action towards campaigns of misinformation and disinformation and falsified media reports which aim to obliterate the truth, denying the public the right to information in contradiction with the values of democracy and freedom of the press and media ethics. Mr. Chair, we align ourselves with the statements of the Arab group, the NAM movement. This year, we celebrate the 75th uh, anniversary of the Universal Declaration, the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Program of Action and Declaration, and we are the furthest behind when it comes to those principles, when it comes to the universality of human rights, including the right to development. It is regrettable to see an escalation in this uh, discourse talking about double standards and uh, denying the universality of human rights. Human rights are used as a political tool and to impose certain principles and values on countries, which is contrary to the sovereignty principle and the rights of countries to choose their morals within their national context. And um, we would like to say that those kinds of calls on claims harm the uh, unity of human rights. 
on the backdrop of what the world is, challenge, is, is facing, the challenges the world is facing, including climate challenges, we must pay attention to the fact that achieving human rights requires the cooperation and not division. My delegation would like to mention what the uh, human rights, uh, uh, the Office of the Human Rights um, High Commissioner mentioned when it comes to the equality between the two conventions uh, uh, making political and civil rights equal to social, economic and cultural rights. The uh, current architectural finance affects the right of people to development and this needs to be reformed, taking into consideration the priorities of developing countries, thus allowing them to achieve human rights and development. And this is out of uh, international solidarity with respect to the sovereignty of countries. We support the work of the High Commissioner and we are calling to promote the special mandate holders, take, especially for developing countries. And on top of the list is the right to development. Looking forward to constructive uh, discussions when it comes to a, an international convention. Egypt is deeply concerned about what the uh, Muslim communities are suffering and other religious minorities when it comes to the increase in hate speech and xenophobia. We warn against the ongoing campaigns of misinformation through media and uh, digitally. This is contrary to the freedom of expression and principles of democracy. Egypt on the national level pays a lot of attention to uh, fulfill its commitments when it comes to human rights. In 2021, we launched our national strategy and we issued a report on what has been done in 2022 in order to treat all rights equally when it comes to our policies as well as to our legislations. Thank you. I thank the distinct of Egypt and give the floor to Kuwait. Sayyid al-Rais, Ba'd and the Bid. Honorable Chair, first of all, I cannot speak of anything else before telling you what my humanitarian instinct and my moral imperative dictate. The world has witnessed yesterday a brutal shelling of al mamadani Hospital in the Palestinian city of Gaza on the part of Israeli occupation forces. This has left hundreds dead and hundreds innocent, unarmed people injured. This is something we condemn and abhor in the strongest of terms, as it is a clear and unequivocal violation of the principles of the international humanitarian law. This dangerous development compels the international community to shed any double standards or selectivity in the implementation of international humanitarian law when it comes to the criminal Israeli practices. This also requires a firm stance in order to provide protection for unarmed civilians. What has happened yesterday and what has been happening to our brothers and sisters in occupied Palestine is not condoned by any religion or law or any human instinct, regardless of what state exercises this. We reaffirm our commitment to respecting human rights comprehensively. This is something that we have been inspired to do by our Islamic principles. Our religion enshrines the principles of equality and justice. They are things that we seek to protect within the framework of protecting human rights. And on the national level, our constitution seeks to achieve freedom, equality, and justice. We have emphasized the importance of free education and health care with no discrimination on the basis of origin, language, or sex, in addition to the importance of freedom of opinion and expression, which is something that relevant international instruments have emphasized. In that context, we are keen on establishing a number of institutions and bodies concerned with the promotion and protection of human rights, including the National Office for Human Rights, it aims to promote and protect human rights and work on disseminating and enhancing respect for public and private rights within the context of the rules stipulated by our constitution and in a manner that is not contradictory to Islamic Sharia law. And in that regard, the Kuwaiti parliament in June agreed to create a new committee concerned with women, 
family and child. And this is consistent with our firm belief and our strong keenness on the field of human rights and fundamental freedoms, stemming from our realization that this has reflections on both the local and international levels. And with regards to achieving gender equality, I would like to refer to the efforts and endeavors we undertake in that regard. We have made sure women take leadership positions in our state. Over the past decade, the governments of Kuwait have always had a female element in addition to the prominent and effective participation of Kuwaiti women in the parliament by achieving the trust of uh, voters in our latest parliamentary elections. We have also seen a positive and tangible participation from Kuwaiti women in important uh, sectors of society, including the judiciary, diplomacy, uh, security, uh, firefighting, and others. We have also done this consistent with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which we joined in 1994. Mr. President, I would like to draw your attention to the importance of uh, plans and strategies aiming to achieve human rights. Nevertheless, what we need more and more than ever is a comprehensive strategy that puts a framework and determines the necessary measures in order to achieve these joint goals so that human rights can be inclusive and universal. Finally, in light of the untraditional threats that we are facing and their transnational nature, in addition to climate change, the spread of epidemics and threats to cybersecurity, there is no path forward except through multilateral action and concerted efforts in order to face all the threats we are facing, with no exception, and especially in terms of human rights. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Kuwait. Uh, colleagues, I've been asked from, by the interpreters to request you to, to, uh, to read out your statements at a speed that is, uh, makes it possible for them to, to translate. I, of course, understand that the time constraints are terrible, so um, I know it's a difficult, a difficult thing to, to it's a catch-22 situation in a way. I now give the floor to Angola. You have the floor. On behalf of member states of the SADC region, allow me to thank the special rapporteur, Ms. Alena Duan, for her findings on the negative consequences of overcompliance, secondary sanctions, and civil and criminal penalties related to the circumvention of sanction regimes. As observed by the Special Rapporteur, these measures, often employed as means to enforce unilateral sanctions, have severe consequences, including barring foreign companies from doing business. Similarly, foreign individuals might face refusal of entry along with freezing of assets. SADAC is concerned by the complexity and ambiguity inherent in multiple evolving and overlapping sanctions regimes. The Special Rapporteur rightly raised the alarm about the extraterritorial nature of these sanctions. SADAC is deeply concerned that with persistent global challenges such as climate change and health threats, the sanctions continue to curtail the capacity of target countries, including Zimbabwe, to adequately respond to these challenges. The group is concerned that, as stated in the report, when sanctions affect the rights of an entire population, the impact is felt more among vulnerable persons, including women, children, people with disability, the elderly, refugee, internal displaced persons, migrants, among others, thus defe defeating the endeavor to leave no one and no place behind. It is our collective responsibility to engage in constructive dialogue, cooperate with the Special Rapporteur, and address these challenges to foster a more just and equitable international community. SADAC is sudden that some countries that impose sanctions refused to constructively engage the Special Rapporteur. SADC full supports the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the negative impact of the UCM on the enjoyment of human rights and her conclusions that sanctions, including secondary sanctions, and overcompliance by foreign banks and companies has detrimental implications 
for the attainment of SDGs and the right to development in Zimbabwe and the region. In conclusion, I wish to remind you all that SADC designated 25th October of each year as SADC Anti-Sanction Day to stand in solidarity with Zimbabwe against the illegal sanctions. In that regard, SADC's wish to reaffirm its solidarity with the government and people of Zimbabwe and to reiterate its call for unconditional removal of the sanctions. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Angola on behalf of the Southern African Development Community, SADC. I now give the floor to Saudi Arabia. Chair, at the outset, we endorse the statement made on behalf of the regional groups to which my delegation belongs. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is a founding UN member and spares no effort to cooperate with the bodies and international human rights mechanisms. My country uh, aims to um, make good on all of its commitments, including human rights conventions and, the, and also through the bodies uh, under this convention. We have presented all of our relevant reports on this matter. In order to promote national capacity, we have launched more than 85 programs and activities in the area of human rights under the Memorandum of Understanding with the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Moreover, my country over recent years has um, undertaken a number of historic uh, developments and reforms in human rights. These reforms have uh, dealt with the institutional and legal frameworks and also uh, other measures, including for development and promotion of uh, the rights to recourse. These reforms and developments were undertaken in a rather short time, and this shows the political will to respond to all that has to do with promoting and safeguarding the human rights. These reforms are ongoing, resolutely. My country welcomes the progress made in developing an international convention on the right to development, and we look forward to the steps that the General Assembly has planned to that end in order to reach international consensus ambitiously in this regard. At the international scale, my country believes that international efforts are key for the promotion to the right to development through a Saudian fund for development. Since its creation, we have Uh, conceded 733 loans for development to fund more than uh, 85 projects in countries throughout the world. We believe in the importance of humanitarian aid and humanitarian assistance to promote human rights in the world. Humanitarian assistance and emergency relief provided by our kingdom over the last 25 years have uh, exceeded $96 billion worth. This has helped more than 164 nations throughout the world through various organizations, including international ones. My country believes that the Palestinian cause and its top uh, remains a major cause until this brother uh, can restore its rights and live in self-determination and in an independent state with Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as its capital. As under the Security Council resolution on this matter, my kingdom categorically rejects any calls for the forced displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. We also denounce and firmly condemn the crime perpetrated by Israeli forces who have bombarded uh, uh, the hospital in Gaza with uh, hundreds of victims, including civilians and children. This is a serious development, and this brings the international community to this uh, is, leads to double standards when it comes to an IHL and 
the Israeli practices. We call for an immediate uh, lifting of the siege imposed against on Gaza and to open humanitarian corridors as soon as possible to respond to the the needs of the Palestinian people. A few days ago, we provided two million dollars and we support the draft resolution presented before the third committee to conclude the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia affirms its commitment to pursue efforts for the promotion and protection of human rights and will continue to cooperate with the United Nations and the international community to promote these rights. Thank you, sir. I thank the distinguished representative of Saudi Arabia and give the floor to Sweden. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, Sweden aligns itself with the uh, statement of the European Union. If you ask a random person in the street what they think of when they, when they hear the words human rights, they might say equal rights or possibly freedom from fear, freedom, equality. A perfect summary of the stunningly beautiful first sentence of the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. A sentence that has been repeated so often in the past 75 years that we sometimes forget what a defining perspective it represents. Throughout human history, it has in fact been very rare for a human being to be born free. In the sense, free to live the life you wish. Nor, as you know, have we been equal. Our sex, the color of our skin, our religion, our class, our sexual orientation, or our disability traditionally sets limits, strict limits, for what was possible. Defined our worth and our rights in the eyes of society. The greatness of the Universal Declaration and the reason it imp its impact has been so enormous is that it challenges these hierarchies. It puts the individual, the so-called ordinary person, at the center. It determines the state must respect the rights of the individ individual, protect these rights against abuses, even against the rich and powerful, and ensure that everyone's basic human rights are fulfilled so that the full potential of every individual can be fully realized. But the Universal Declaration is not just a vision. It is also a blueprint for how that vision can be achieved. It sets up a system with individuals as right holders and states as duty bearers accountable for violations. It has inspired an expanding infrastructure for accountability at the national, regional, and international level. Yet, as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we know that this system is being challenged. We are seeing efforts to weaken accountability, to dilute and divert the obligations of states. Efforts to restore traditional power structures by turning the clock back on gender equality, the rights of LGBTI persons, and on sexual and reproductive health rights. The harassment and illegal detention of journalists and human rights defenders, the closing down of civic space, the suppression of independent media and judiciaries. And most alarming of all, we are seeing more armed conflict than in any time since 1945, with an increase, with an, with an increase in extrajudicial executions, torture, sexual and gender-based violence and other conflict-related violations. Russia's ruthless aggression against Ukraine in blatant violation of international law and the UN Charter is an obvious and horrific example. In the dark period of war, let us return for a moment to that first article of the Universal Declaration, uh, uh, to the second sentence. Sorry. It is less often quoted than the first. It's rarely printed on mugs or tote bags, yet it is perhaps equally important. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. The sentence is important because it underlines another essential thing about human rights. It's up to us. The choices we make, how we act towards one another, how we safeguard the international rules-based order that we have inherited is ultimately what will determine our future. 
There is no one else that can come and fix this world for us. The international human rights system is one of mankind's greatest achievements. But like other, uh, other forms of infrastructure, it requires maintenance to continue to function. It needs us to speak up in its defense when it's being challenged. It requires our reason and our conscience, perhaps more than ever. Sweden will continue to stand together with all global partners who are ready to take on this challenge. In this anniversary year, there is simply no acceptable alternative. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Sweden and give the floor to the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Unfortunately, we have recently been confronted with conflicts and divisions on a scale not seen in decades, including in Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Ukraine, and in Israel and Gaza. This makes us realize once again the true value of peace. At the same time, we must shed more light on people in marginalized situations and living under authoritarianism or totalitarianism. We are especially concerned with the systematic, widespread, and gross violations of human rights in the DPRK. It has been nearly a decade since the 2014 report of the Commission of Inquiry on DPRK human rights concluded that these are crimes against humanity. Yet there has been no significant improvement Instead of addressing these issues, the DPRK has diverted its resources into an unprecedented escalation of provocative ballistic missile launches and nuclear weapon development in violation of multiple Security Council resolutions. In this context, the Security Council recently held a public meeting on the DPRK human rights situation for the first time in six years to address the inextricable linkage between the DPRK's human rights violations and the illicit weapons program. On top of that, today I take the floor with a very heavy heart to address another pressing matter, the forced repatriation of North Korean escapees detained in third countries. The special rapporteur on the DPRK human rights situation, Ms. Salmon, has expressed extreme concern about this issue in her report to the General Assembly last week, reiterating that the non-refoulement principle should be observed. She clearly stated that there are long-standing and credible reports to believe that escapees from the DPRK that are forcefully returned to the country would be subjected to torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment and punishment. In particular, over 2,000 individuals from the DPRK, approximately 70% of whom are women, are estimated to be detained in China as so-called illegal migrants. The Special Rapporteur reiterated in her report her extreme concern about the imminent risk of forced repatriation of those detainees in the third country. Unfortunately and sadly, the risk became reality. According to several sources, it seems that a number of North Korean people in a third country had been repatriated in line with the partial opening of the DPRK's international borders. In a statement on this matter by the OHCHR issued yesterday more than a dozen experts, including the Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances, called for respecting the principle of non reforma Also, they emphasized the non reforma principle must be applied to all individuals at all times, regardless of their migratory status. They further reiterated that non refoulement is an essential protection under international human rights, refugee, and customary law, and is explicitly included in the Convention Against Torture, as well as the 1951 Convention on Refugees, and its 1967 Protocol, to which the third country is also a party. We all should understand that the horrendous living conditions and the and the human rights situation in the DPRK have continually forced its people to flee across the border, mainly to China. It is both horrifying and heartbreaking to witness North Korean escapees who had risked everything, including their lives, on their long, arduous road to freedom being forcefully repatriated. We are also extremely concerned about the horrors, including the death penalty, that repatriated North Korean individuals face right now in the DPRK. Mr. Chair, we strongly protest this grave human rights incident, which should never happen again. 
The international community cannot tolerate such actions and must stay vigilant and raise their voices to protect the human rights of these people seeking the life that they deserve. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of the Republic of Korea and give the floor to Costa Rica. Senor President, Chair. Costa Rica endorses this discussion on the promotion and protection of human rights, reaffirming our historic commitment with the full realization and gradual advancement of human rights. Costa Ricans see the path forward and the challenges to facing human rights, the current and future challenges of humanity. These rights must be respected by all persons, everywhere and at all times. In my national capacity, I have a few points to make. First, Costa Rica welcomes the, this 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because of its essential contribution to the advancement and development of international law, as well as because of its direct impact on the lives of peoples. Today, as an international community, we have a mandate to fulfill the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It contains goals that also mean vital human rights obligations. This includes right, uh, the rights of women, girls, but also to health, education, and housing. That is why we believe we must bolster un the understanding and integration of the human rights and sustainable development agendas at all levels, including as regards the production and monitoring of statistics. We trust that the summit of the future and discussions in their various areas will enable us to advance in this direction. My next point, although this right was not included in the Universal Declaration, the right to a healthy, healthy, clean environment is vital to achieving all other rights. It is also a, an autonomous right, as was recognized by this General Assembly at it, in its historic Resolution 76300 of 28 July 2022. The triple environmental crisis is clearly the most existential threat facing humanity today. That is why Costa Rica is convinced of the need to give full implement implementation to this right and to tackle its interdependence and interlinkages to provide solutions that are based on persons and nature. There is no other way possible. Third, Costa Rica believes that it is only through solidarity and shared responsibility and respect for human rights that we can have comprehensive responses to migration. Costa Rica is the country in Latin America that has the largest share of uh, migrants among its total population. And in line with data from the High Commissioner for Human rights of the United Nations, uh, rather for refugees. We are the, we rank third in the world in receiving asylum seekers uh, applications. This has reached more than 270 million in September of this year. However, as a middle income country, we have limited resources and our current and emerging needs have been made invisible. Costa Rica, therefore, calls upon the international community to take immediate action to, in order to manage the migration flows in a way that is orderly and safe for persons. Just as important, Costa Rica also calls upon making use of this anniversary in order to allocate the necessary resources to the, the universal architecture of human rights, in particular the OHCHR. Uh, providing it resource, resources that it needs in order to carry out its mandate. And uh, this also includes support to the system, uh, to treaty bodies. 
the human rights focus throughout the work of the organization uh, plays a key role, yet only 4.3% of the core budget was attributed to this in 2022. We to conclude, Costa Rica calls upon all stakeholders, states, civil society, the private sector, academia, and the media to join in the initiative of the High Commissioner with specific commitments revitalizing the common ideal of all peoples and nations. I think the microphone has been cut off. I thank the distinguished representative of Costa Rica and give the floor to Mali. Please allow me to congratulate you on the excellent way you've been uh, uh, guiding our deliberations. I also would like to welcome the efforts to advise, alert, and call to action by OHCHR through various mechanisms. Mr. Chair, we are attached to the principle of pro the promotion of human rights, namely democracy, the rule of law, and the independence of the judiciary and good governance. The government of Mali has always uh, uh, endeavored to guarantee these rights and basic f freedoms uh, regardless of people's race, uh, gender, religion, or gender. This uh, traditional value is enshrined in our constitution and is expressed in the government's action uh, through its international obligations. Here I would like to say that Mali is a party to basically um, almost all international instruments on the promotion and protection of human rights and is fully cooperating with all of the regional and international mechanisms in this area. Furthermore, Mali has established a national judicial framework for that. Chair. Still, uh, the multilateral uh, crisis uh, uh, that we've been witnessing since 2012, uh, the terrorists, for example, um, the means that we have the priority of security to protect our people and their goods. Mr. Chair, we are determined to rise to the challenges, in particular security challenges. And my, the government of my country is uh, trying to minimize that impact or even to totally eliminate that. We are convinced uh, that the situation of human rights is um, something that hinges on the security situation. And that's why we intensify our efforts to strengthen the operational capacities of our law enforcement and security forces to improve the security situation. Mr. Chair, the principle of universality, impartiality, and um, objectivity, and non-selectivity of human rights, the principle of the rule of law, is on every state, uh, and this is something that tallies poorly with the hierarchization of these laws. That's the way we read it. Um, in my country, we object to uh, human rights being used at the detriment of the right of people to decide on their destiny. Um, Mr. Chair, we are aware that above and beyond security issues, we need to combat <coughs> impunity. We organized many assizes so as to judge the various crimes having to do with economic and financial um, uh, offenses. Our courts have been elected so as to enforce the existing framework with the innovations introduced to them. They're dealing with terrorism, modern-day slavery, and various uh, kinds of violence against women and children. Dealing also with crime of terrorism, the fact that there's no statute of limitations for that. And all of this so as to improve our judicial system. There are also preparation measures and we are working on the national policy on that, having to do with the crisis since 1960s. 
We also have the text stipulating the rules on the reparation resulting from human rights violations. Mr. Chair, to conclude, I would like to reiterate the firm commitment of the government of my country to continue our cooperation with the Council of various mechanisms to make sure the promotion and protection of human rights becomes a reality, whilst we respect the values and the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter. I thank you. Representative of Mali and give the floor to the Dominican Republic. Thank you very much, Chair. We welcome the reports presented by the Secretary General on the human rights agenda and take note of the valuable recommendations therein. The promotion of human rights is a moral obligation, but it is also an imperative for peace and prosperity globally. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights on its 75th anniversary therefore continues to call for so global solidarity and for championing uh, in an unwavering way these human rights. In 2004, in my country, we have actively promoted human rights through the creation of an interinstitutional human rights commission which seeks to safeguard human rights defenders but also to maintain a cross-cutting policy within our governance. In addition, there are gender policies, policies on climate change and on territorial integrity. There are, is the creation of public space, including for expression and for participation. This is part and parcel of this national vision to safeguard the rights of our citizens. We have established a, uh, an ombudsman whose essential task is to ensure public administration functions properly and to make uh, to address ethics uh, laws and international treaties adequately. We've also implemented crucial reforms in the judicial branch in order to strengthen its independence and transparency in combating corruption and impunity. In Starting in 2018, we have uh, endeavored with great, uh, greatly towards human rights and protecting those. We have worked together with civil society and international organizations. We have this represents the government's firm uh, commitment to protecting these rights. We have a plan with guidelines from the high. Commissioner for Human Rights of the UN, focusing on f four strategic areas, civil, political rights, economic and social, cultural rights, uh, human rights of, uh, and the environment, uh, the rights of persons in vulnerable situations, and the implementation of international standards. This approach reflects our commitment to human rights, but also our determination to tackle global challenges and national ones with uh, specific measures towards building a future that is more fair and equitable for all. Lastly, sir, on 10 October, my country was elected to, uh, to have a seat on the Human Rights Council of the United Nations for 2024 through 2026. We are committed to work tirelessly to address human rights violations globally and to foster peace, justice, and equality. We seek to strengthen the international human rights system, promoting cooperation among countries and organizations. We will uh, push for dialogue and will work tirelessly to have a world where all human beings uh, have their fundamental rights upheld. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Dominican Republic. I give the floor to Canada. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 75 years ago, the UN acknowledged that human rights are inherent to the dignity of every one of us and that they must be promoted and protected by all states. This universal acknowledgement and its reflection in law, in policy, and in practice has led to significant increases in quality of life, in health and education, in access to economic opportunities, and in civil and political realms. People are better positioned to realize their full potential than at any other time in human history. But traditional barriers to equity and equality remain and in some cases are growing. 
The work of this committee is rightly focused on where progress has been uneven or is slipping. Women's and girls' human rights are under attack. In Afghanistan, the Taliban have systematically deprived women and girls of their human rights to education, to work, to health, to justice. This cannot continue. The situation is grim for women and girls in Iran. We condemn the violent enforcement of the chastity and hijab law, its recent passing of legislation to increase the severity of punitive measures against those seen as non-compliant, and the ongoing brutal suppression of Iranian citizens, particularly women and girls. Women's rights are human rights. This is not negotiable. Canada will continue to stand up for their rights and the rights of all marginalized individuals and communities, wherever they are threatened. Recognition of the inherent dignity of LGBTI persons is growing steadily. We applaud those who have eliminated discriminatory laws, many of which are colonial legacies. If anything, anti-buggery laws are the cultural exports. As Chief Justice Chandrashud of the Supreme Court of India pointed out in a recent judgment, queerness is not urban or elite. It is not just an English-speaking man with a white collar who can claim to be queer, but equally a woman in an agricultural job in a village. He is right. I'm pretty confident that had I been born in an Indian village or in an Indian city, I would still have been born gay. I will now switch to French. Nous reconnaissons. We acknowledge that in many places there is a great gap, gap between the rights announced and their implementation. Furthermore, the barriers I just mentioned are frequently erected by governments who are trying to um, keep uh, their population in line. And we can see a wider gap in conflicts currently underway where violations of people's rights are endemic. In the Middle East, we firmly support the appeal by the Secretary General to immediately and unconditionally free all of the hostages and to make sure that all parties fully respect the international humanitarian law. The 600 days of Russian aggression against Ukraine did not make us insensitive to violations which continue daily or to the need for accountability. Canada firmly supports the Sudanese people in their uh, appeal for democratic transition by the civilians. The response to all of these challenges is not to run away from them or pretend that they're politicized or even worse by what about it isn't. The rights of people are duties and obligations on every one of us. Every state in Canada takes these obligations seriously. Canada can and uh, uh, will do, should do more, in particular when it comes to the indigenous peoples, and in particular the indigenous women and girls. Canada knows uh, uh, deep historic structural problems, but we're trying to do better and to do better for all of the citizens of our country. We hope that individually and collectively, we will all be able to benefit from the 75th anniversary of the Declaration to help everyone realize their full potential. I thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Canada and give the floor to Iceland. Mr. Chair. Iceland aligns itself with the statements made by Luxembourg, Ireland and the United Kingdom made on behalf of three separate groups of countries. At the outset, allow me also to say a few words about the horrific hostilities unfolding in Israel and, and Gaza. Millions of people are gravely affected. The growing number of deaths among civilians is devastating. We are appalled by the strike on al alhi Hospital, adding further to the suffering we have witnessed in the past days. Iceland has condemned in the stronger terms the barbaric acts committed by Hamas. Terrorism can never be justified. It is clear that Israel has a right to defend itself within the bounds of international law that provides states with both rights and obligations. Both are sacred. We are deeply concerned about the risk for further escalation. International humanitarian law must be respected and upheld at all times. Breaches thereof must be carefully investigated safe and unimpeded humanitarian access must be ensured, and civilians and civilian objects, medical personnel and humanitarian workers and assets must be protected. Mr. Chair, human rights are a key pillar of Iceland's foreign and development policy, based on the conviction that all human rights are universal, indivisible, interrelated, interdependent, and mutually reinforcing. This year, we mark the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
that proclaim that everyone is born free and equal in dignity and rights, no matter their identity, beliefs or circumstances. This milestone document is still a guiding light for our work. Unfortunately, we are seeing challenges to many of the basic rights we thought had been secured and accepted. We are witnessing an increase in hatred and intolerance, both in the real world as well as on social media and other online platforms. Religious intolerance, violent nationalism and racism, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, are on the rise. We see signs of increasing homophobia, transphobia and biphobia. We are also witnessing increased hate speech and a pushback on the gains that have been made towards gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights. We must reverse and fight these trends and work together to secure universal human rights of all people, regardless of race, religion, beliefs, disability, sexual orientation and gender identity. We must stand up for the values of democracy, freedom and human rights and defend the freedom of expression and assembly and tolerance for dissent as an integral part of public discourse where we agree to disagree and fight for each other's right to do so. Mr. Chair, these are some of the primary motivations between Iceland's decision to seek a seat on the Human Rights Council for the term 2025 to 27 as a Nordic candidature at the next elections in the fall of 2024. Iceland will actively contribute to the Council's core mandate of advancing the promotion and protection of human rights around the globe and addressing human rights violations and abuses. abuses. Iceland will also continue to engage with countries from all regions of the world in an inclusive manner, recognizing the critical importance of respectful and genuine dialogue for a more efficient and effective Council. This is an important point. Member states in the Human Rights Council do not have to be perfect. None of us are. But we can all do better and we should all aim to do so. We should not shy away from dialogue and neither shy away from calling out human rights violations regardless of where they take place or by whom. Mr. Chair, regardless of the Third Committee important work, there are real heroes out there defending human rights, risking their lives and liberties by calling out injustices, standing up for democracy and equality, and speaking out against discrimination and intolerance. These brave people deserve our attention and support, especially as many of them increasingly face derision, threats, and attempts to silence their voices. Especially as this year marks the 25th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, we call on this committee to reiterate its call for providing safe and enabling environment for them, and strongly condemn reprisals against those who cooperate with the UN system. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Iceland and give the floor to India. Thank you, Chair. The promotion and protection of human rights are essential for fostering a just and equitable society where individuals can live in freedom and with dignity. Human rights recognize the inherent dignity of each person, underlining the idea that all individuals are born free and equal in rights and should be treated as such. Human rights demand that no one should be discriminated against based on factors like race, gender, religion, or social status. Mr. Chair, India's commitment to rule of law, democracy, development, and human rights is as old as our nation. As a state party of the principal covenants on human rights and of practically all other major human rights instruments, India has consistently promoted civil and political rights on the one hand and economic, social, and cultural rights on the other. While the Constitution guarantees its citizens fundamental civil and political rights, independent and impartial judiciary, a progressive parliament, a free and vibrant media, and a thriving social, civil society has, have reinforced the safeguards to, uh, in order to ensure that the, these human rights for our citizens are not denied. Our democratic values are reflected in our strong belief in principle of freedom of speech and expression. Mr. Chair, India has established several statutory body to protect human rights. The National Human Rights Commission is one such institution responsible for addressing human rights violation and promoting awareness. It conducts investigation, provides redressal mechanism, and advocates for human rights issues. The National Commission for Protection of Child Rights in India ensures that laws and policies are in consonance with child rights as enshrined in Convention on the Rights of the Child. The National Commission for Women promotes gender equality and promotes the rights of women. 
The Commission works towards preventing and responding to crimes against women, including domestic violence, harassment, and trafficking. Mr. Chair, India has taken several innovative right-based social protection measures in pursuit of inclusive growth that has lifted to lifted millions out of multidimensional poverty. Let me give few examples. The world's largest healthcare ins uh, insurance uh, program, National Health Protection System uh, scheme, covers 100 million families, providing free treatment to 500 million people. The world's largest affordable housing program for the poor has led to building of over 23.5 million houses till date. To protect women and children from indoor air pollution, 94 million free cooking gas connection have been issued under the Prime Minister Ujwala scheme. Mr. Chair, more than 1.4 million elected women representatives lead in formulation and implementation of public policies at grassroots level. To promote gender equality in September 2023, Indian Parliament passed Women's Reservation Bill to reserve one-third of seats in national and state parliaments for women. There are legal and other institutional safeguards to protect women from child marriage, domestic violence, and sexual harassment at workplace. Working women in India enjoy paid maternity leave for 26 weeks. India has a robust legal framework for the protection of children from sexual assault, pornography, and trafficking in person. The Right to Education Act of 2009 made elementary education a fundamental right, ensuring free and compulsory education for children aged 6 to 14. Mr. Chair, in conclusion, I reiterate India's commitment to constructively engage with the international community on a range of issues in promoting respect and realization of all human rights globally. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of India and give the floor to Afghanistan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to begin by expressing my deep condolences and solidarity with the victims and families of the Palestinian people who lost their loved ones in the heinous attack on the hospital yesterday. We condemn any acts that lead to the killings of civilians and innocent people. Mr. Chair, I would also like to express our condolences to the people of Herat in Afghanistan who lost their loved ones in the recent catastrophic earthquake that has struck Afghanistan. Over the past two weeks, four consecutive earthquakes with a magnitude of 6.3 have occurred in Herat province. Regrettably, these seismic events have already claimed the lives of at least 2,400 people and caused extensive damage to homes and infrastructure in more than 100 villages. Consequently, thousands of people are now left without shelter, access to clean water, or health care facilities. With the harsh winter fast approaching, the situation is growing increasingly dire, particularly for women and children. In the face of such immense suffering, I make an earnest appeal from the United Nations, international partners, and donor countries. We earnestly require your assistance in delivering critical aid, including food, clean water, medical supplies, and shelter materials to the affected areas. The immediate and primary focus should be on the providing relief to survivors and helping them rebuild their lives. Allow me to express our deepest gratitude to the UN agencies, NGOs, and countries that have already provided essential emergency assistance during this challenging time. Mr. Chair, it is with deep concern that we address the current human rights situation in Afghanistan as the country faces a complex and multifaceted social, economic, political, and security challenges. Two years after the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban has raised serious questions about the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms for Afghan people, particularly for women, minorities, and those who have worked towards democratic values. The denial of fundamental human rights and freedoms continues to intensify under the Taliban's rule as they embark on a mission to purify society based on their hardline and false interpretation of Sharia and Afghan tradition. Our utmost concern is the impact on women's and girls' rights and fundamental freedoms. The Taliban regime imposed systematic discrimination and strict gender-based restrictions, denying women and girls access to education, employment, and public life. 
These actions erased the hard-fought gains made by Afghan women over the past two decades and undermined their ability to realize their full potential and contribute in the economic development. The systematic operation created climate of fear, gender persecution, and gender apartheid. Marginalized and minority groups, including ethnic and religious groups such as Hazara, Sikhs, Sufis, are increasingly marginalized and vulnerable, while the Taliban's commitment to general amnesty has been called into question due to widespread extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, torture, and ill treatment. Moreover, the suppression of dissent has intensified, and civic and media spaces continue to shrink. The application of corporal punishments only serves the, to maintain rule by fear rather than the rule of law, with few checks and balances on the arbitrary exercises of power. Access to justice is severely limited, not available, particularly for women and girls facing, fa facing forced and child marriages and violence. The physical and mental health of the Afghan population, which has already suffered the impact of over four decades of armed conflict, face severe consequences due to the ongoing human rights violations. We welcome the special, uh, the special rapporteur's mandate renewal and his report on the situation of human rights in Afghanistan. We stress the importance of constantly monitoring and reporting mechanisms on human rights violations and gender persecution by the Taliban and emphasize on accountability for human rights violations and end of impunity. To achieve enduring peace and security in Afghanistan, a country as diverse as Afghanistan must be governed with genuine inclusivity, grounded in respect for human rights, and dedicated to ensuring equality and dignity for all its citizens. It, this can be achieved only through a united, collective, and sustained efforts by all stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Afghanistan and give the floor to Cambodia. Chair, my delegation aligns with the statement of Malaysia on behalf of ASEAN. Enhancement of human rights in line with the principle of the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights is the duty of every government and nation. Let us all reaffirm our commitment to the fundamental human rights and freedom. Let us all strive for a world where justice, equality, and freedom are not just ideals but realities for all. Let us all ensure that our efforts to promote human rights are done with full appreciation of varying political, economic, social, and cultural circumstances. Let us all stand against politicization, double standards, selectivity, and interference in the internal affairs of other states on the pretext of protecting human rights and freedom. Mr. Chairman, the promotion and protection of human rights is the cornerstone of my government's national and foreign policies. Cambodia was the first country in Asia to host the field office of the Human Rights Commissioner, which is now the oldest in the world. We have worked constructively with seven successive country special rapporteurs on human rights in Cambodia. I hope this alone would attest to Cambodia's genuine resolve to enhance human rights and freedom. Cambodia's human rights situation is in progress, and we still have a lot of development issues to address. But life now is a far, far cry from when the point when we emerged from abject poverty in every aspect due to decades of destructive war, the killing field, and further deprivation of our rights to development. Cambodia is now among the fastest growing economies with poverty reduced by 1% every year. A country that once survived on food aid now has more than enough to feed its population. A country where schooling was one abolished, teachers executed, now can afford to go beyond expanding access to enhancing the quality of education. Cambodia is among the best SDG achievers. My nation, my government has made no, eff no less effort on promoting civil and political rights of our people. For example, gender equality and women empowerment are fully mainstream. Cambodia now has mobile broadband internet subscribers that surpass the number of its 16 million population. It's simply cheap and not at all complicated to share and express views online. Apart from many hundreds of 
Local media outlets, foreign media are also easily and freely accessible. But freedom of expression must be exercised without infringing on the rights of other individuals, as well as public orders and safety and national interests. My delegation believes the same rule is applied by all civilized nations, and it is unfair for countries like Cambodia to be criticized and chastised for applying the same rule. Last July, Cambodia successfully and peacefully held its seven general election with 18 parties contesting and a turnout rate of 84.59 percent, the highest since 1993. It is needless to point out that Cambodia does not have any regulation to apply to people to vote, and under the watchful eyes of hundreds of observers, they can freely express their will through the ballots. The high turnout in itself truly reflects our people's political maturity and enthusiasm in choosing which party to run the country. It's only natural to expect progress of each human rights dimension to go on par or in tandem with all other dimensions. For us, human rights and freedom are in progress on every front, and we need support and encouragement to keep building the advancements. In this sense, Cambodia opposes to the unilateral cohesive measures as they are contradicting to the fundamental principles of the UN Charter, impede the rights to development, and hinder the achievement of the 2030 SDG agenda. In closing, Cambodia remains committed to working with all stakeholders to further promote and protect human rights within the rule of law advance sustainable development and pursue our irreversible democratic journey. In closing, may I join others in mourning for the loss of innocent civilian in the recent conflict in the Middle East. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Cambodia and give the floor to Nicaragua. Thank you very much, Chair. Our delegation endorses the statements made by El Salvador on behalf of the System for Central American Integration, SICA, Venezuela, on behalf of the Group of Friends in Defense of the Charter of the United Nations, the People's Republic of China, and Pakistan on behalf of, the, of groups of countries and also the statement that will be made by Azerbaijan on behalf of NAM. The Universal Human Rights Declaration highlights the commitment of the international community to inherent rights inherent to human beings with peace, good faith, solidarity, and respect for equality between states. It views as essential the promotion of the development of friendly and harmonious relations among nations to benefit humanity, respecting inalienable rights. In Nicaragua, human rights and the restoration of rights is a policy of state, a, vo a humanist vocation of our government for reconciliation and national unity by restoring social justice and the rights of all persons. Since 2007, our government has upholding the its political constitution and laws of our National Assembly has given priority to the restoration of the rights of Nicaraguan families to housing, education, recreation, health, uh, food security, citizen security, to work, to public services, uh, and access to drinking water and sanitation, among others. These rights had been uh, historically denied, postponed, or violated by neoliberalism. Sir, the restitution of the rights of health will always be a priority for our government, guaranteeing and strengthening its uh, service without discrimination and uh, ensuring it is effective, of high quality, and efficient with tangible results and international recognition. The human right to education is restored through uh, in a qualitative way through the ongoing improvement of the educational process and in heightening the capacity of teachers and civil servants 
bringing education to Nicaraguans, regardless of their geographical location or socioeconomic level. Sir, guaranteeing sovereignty and food security and nutrition, n nutritional security to families has also been a commitment of our country. And uh, we ensure to farmers and field workers that they can work the land in peace, security, and in tranquility. Nicaragua has also restored the, right, the human right to property and to decent housing uh, through construction and access to social housing with programs uh, for public housing. We are committed to the rights of all of our indigenous and Afro-descendant persons in Nicaragua. We have finalized the process of giving titles uh, to territories for these peoples. That is to say more than 33% of Nicaraguan land. Of particular relevance in human rights is the gender equality with the restoration of those rights of political, economic, social, and cultural rights of women and uh, through policies uh, based on uh, labor and salary opportunities. We also address the rights of persons with inability, uh, disabilities through policies, programs, and projects, and draft laws to strengthen their access to their rights. Sir, despite the aggressions of imperialist, colonialist, and neo-colonial countries with their corrosive and illegal unilateral coercive measures against our country, our government continues and will continue to promote the Nicaraguan right to sustainable human development, the right to peace, stability, and progress, to the exercise of all rights and fundamental freedoms. Sir, Nicaragua wishes to seize this opportunity to reaffirm its support to the principle of one single China uh, as a part of uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet being an inalienable part of its territory. Therefore, we oppose the baseless accusations made against China with a view to politicizing this and based on disinformation. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Nicaragua and give the floor to United Republic of Tanzania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My delegation associates itself with a statement delivered by Angola on behalf of SADC member state, and I will make the following remarks in my national capacity. Mr. Chair, my delegation takes the floor to reiterate its position on the question of sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and non-interference in the internal matters of uh, states in the milieu of human rights. There are, well, these are well-established principles that must be upheld by all member states without exceptions. It is therefore quite regrettable to witness how human rights are sometimes used to undermine these principles. My delegation family believes that the issue concerning Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet are solely and principal, principally China's domestic affairs that should not be interfered upon. If anything, China has demonstrated its commitment to improve the situation of its people. China has also, for many decades, been assisting countries around the world to realize their social, political, and economic rights, as well as their rights to development. Mr. Chair, Tanzania therefore urges all member states to uphold the principles of universality, impartiality, objectivity, and non-selectivity in the work of this committee and other human rights fora. We should work towards the realization of human rights for all without any biasness or double standard, while also upholding purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. Tanzania stands for justice, fairness, integrity, fairness, integrity, and dignity. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Tanzania and give the floor to Cote d'Ivoire. Mr. Chair, the year of 2023 is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action. And 
these documents recall for member states, they show to member states the road to follow for freedom, equality, and the protection of rights of everyone. Unfortunately, these celebrations take place um, at the time when the world is full of inequality, structural injustices, uh, where there is extreme violence resulting from emerging or continuing conflicts and humanitarian migration food crises. The current state, therefore, is not a particularly conducive environment to the full enjoyment of human rights, and the challenges we're facing make it make the advent of peaceful, inclusive societies all the more distant. Mr. Chair, during the interactive dialogues in this committee, uh, people in charge of monitoring bodies, um, mandate holders and special procedures and other experts insisted um, the, and underscore the efforts and actions that need to be undertaken to promote and protect human rights. We in Cote d'Ivoire continue with the initiatives aimed at ensuring the freedom of exp expression on uh, human rights. We ratified basically all of the core instruments on human rights and we're doing our utmost to meet the growing requirements so as to honor our obligations. The government of my country, for example, in 2018 established a National Human Rights Council. It is an independent administrative body and it is to promote, protect and defend human rights. In terms of protection, the Council ensures the dissemination of information about legal instruments nationally and internationally, raises the awareness of our people on human rights and trains human rights actors. On protection, uh, the Council conducts non-judiciary investigations on violations of human rights uh, conducted against citizens, victims, or when we're aware of this. It also is uh, looking to the issue of making up all the damages by accompanying victims uh, through the justice process or by putting an end to any uh, ongoing violation. The support of this body in developing uh, the reports, our international documents, and the cooperation with them provided my country with an opportunity to evaluate the situation on the ground, in particular through collecting data, and also allowed us to proceed with a review and updating of our legislative framework. Um, Within our policy to promote and protect human rights, the government of Cote d'Ivoire uh, tackled, tackled in 2014 a law on the protection of human rights advocates. We're trying to create a safe environment for women, women who mobilize themselves to defend their rights, to show their solidarity, and demand, demand respect of such rights for everyone and everywhere. Mr. Chairman, building Peaceful and inclusive societies must uh, include uh, the question of the promotion and protection of human rights. We are of the view that above and beyond one-off initiatives, we need also to have a permanent process which takes into account the pace at which each society is making uh, pa uh, a way forward. And that is why we think that the issue of human rights needs to be looked at within the principle of non-interference and within a permanent constructive dialogue. I thank you. Distinguished representative of Cote d'Ivoire, and give the floor to Zambia. Mr. Chairperson, Zambia is concerned about the situation and loss of innocent lives in the Middle East. We reiterate our, our position that as a peace loving nation, aggression is not a means of resolving dispute. We believe in peaceful and amicable settlement of disputes among, among nations strictly through diplomatic channels. My delegation aligns this statement with those delivered by the African group and the G77 and China and Angola on behalf of SADC on this agenda item. Further, we take note of the Secretary General's report on promotion and protection of human rights as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Member states are encouraged to ensure the world is safe for all to live in. Zambia believes that human, humans everywhere ought to live peace, peaceably and that peace is vital for sustainable de development. However, the world, there, is, there are numerous crises and conflicts that have erupted in, in, involving repeated violations of laws and, and protection of human rights. Thousands of people have lost their lives and survivors have been increasingly compelled to flee 
becoming exposed to heightened risks of death or further violation as they move in conditions that fail to respect human dignity and rights. It is common knowledge that the promotion and protection of human rights is cardinal in enhancing good governance, the rule of law, and ensuring viable peace and stability. In this regard, Zambia observes universal suffrage to ensure administrations are continually and democratically elected. It, is also, it, it should also be noted that Zambia is party to some of the United Nations uh, human rights instruments on effective enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Zambia continues to implement policies and programs to further improve the human rights situation in the country and to overcome challenges in the enjoyment of human rights. We are also undertaking our obligations of state party reporting as required under various human rights treaties to which Zambia is party. In order to enhance the effective and efficient efficiency of state party reporting, the government has improved the establishment of the national mechanism for implementation, reporting, and follow-up. Follow this mechanism is mandated to coordinate the preparation of reporting and follow-up of implementation of recommendations and decisions of treaty bodies on human rights. This is to ensure that Zambia complies with its treaty obligations through coordinated coordination of responsible ministries, departments, and agencies, including non-state actors, to improve, improve the implementation of the outcome of recommendations. Zambia has also extended a standing invitation to special rapporteurs to visit the country, further arising from the treaty bodies' recommendations and universal periodic reviews. The country has undertaken action to review and amend various laws to address issues identified identified to be negative, negatively impacting on the enjoyment of fundamental rights. Among the greatest achievements in 2022 was the enactment of legislation to protect the, the children's rights by domesticating conventions on the right of, ch of the child. The African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child and the Convention on Protection of Children and, Co and Cooperation in Respect of uh, international uh, country adopt, uh, uh, adoption and convention of the civil aspects of international child abduction. The government enacted the Legal Aid Act to ensure that legal aid is granted to civil and, and criminal cases to, 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 to in, indigent person. This means by, government, by the government will ensure the, that all civil citizens, including vulnerable, have their rights protected and ultimately justice in access to everyone in Zambia. This is evidenced through the accession to the protocol of the African uh, Charter on Human Rights, People's Rights, on establishment of the African Charter on Human People's Rights. Further, there has been an increase in the 2024 budgetary allocation to Zambian human rights social sector in its continued effort to make progress. I, I thank the d distinguished representative of Zambia and give the floor to Estonia. No, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. I thought you were there. <laughs> I give the floor to Sudan. Thank you, Chair. We congratulate you on uh, being elected at the helm of this committee and wish your bureau full success as well. We endorse the statement made by the regional groups that we belong to. Sir, this year we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This sets out fundamental rights to be protected especially the right to life. Given the situation that has been ongoing in Sudan for more than six months, military confrontations against a rebel force in violation of human rights and uh, committing crimes against the Sudanese society, destroying infrastructure, hospitals, uh, and uh, it is imperative to put an end to this rebellion once and for all in order to preserve human life and protect promote and protect their dignity. Uh, sir, 
we are doing our utmost uh, under our constitutional right to ensure the safety, security, stability of the state to protect its people and uh, our army is highly qualified and committed to the rules under IHL and the relevant Geneva Conventions. We underscore the respect by the Sudanese uh, forces of, of uh, various aspects, sir. The matter, the human rights aspect, is at the helm of priorities in my country. Our constitution has a specific chapter devoted to human rights and the positive cooperation with international human rights mechanisms. This shows our upholding of our obligations under international law. We continue also to endeavor for the promotion and protection of human rights. It is under these sustained efforts to ensure accountability and combating impunity that the president of, a, uh, of the transition um, has created a national commission of inquiry into human rights violations. This is um, chaired by the main prosecutor. We continue to cooperate with human rights mechanisms. However, we note with concern the unjustified multitude and unnecessary multiplication of human rights instruments. We underscore a HRC 54 L 18 adopted uh, in an untimely way and uh, we need to respond to the humanitarian needs. Only 30% of the UN plan has been uh, honored in this respect. There continues to be serious international rights violations as shown on attacks against uh, schools, hospitals, airports uh, being used by military caserns also in Khartoum. From the first day of the rebellion, civilians were effective, affected. Uh, children are affected and uh, women are being raped. There are 136 cases. There, are case, there is um, gen cases of genocide and ethnic cleansing in certain parts of the country. We need to protect civilians. The rapid forces have destroyed markets and other elements in the country and has forcibly displaced uh, uh, numerous civilians. A number of cars and goods belonging to citizens have been confiscated. There have been uh, serious violations to international human rights violations. We have heard from the OHCHR, Amnesty International, and the group of experts of the UN and others about this. To conclude, the transition phase in my country has been uh, has support from the armed forces. We are at a crucial, uh, delicate uh, time, and we seek the international support towards a democratic transition, respecting integrity, the territorial integrity of Sudan. Thank you, and the integrity of Sudan. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Sudan. I give the floor to Albania. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Albania aligns itself with the statement delivered by the European Union. Mr. Chair, at the outset, I would like to join others in condemning in the strongest terms possible Hamas' unprovoked horrific terrorist attacks on Israel, which are clearly planned to cause indiscriminate destruction, civilian casualties, <coughs> and suffering. These actions are not only legal and immoral, but also pose a severe threat to the security and well-being of the Israeli and Palestinian people alike. Mr. Chair, we are faced with sustained pushback and resistance against the entire human rights agenda. <clears throat> Conflicts are on the rise again. Attacks perpetrated by governments or armed groups against civilians are rising too. The human rights situation in Ukraine remains deeply concerning because of the unjustified and illegal Russian aggression against the country. 
Reports coming from Ukraine continuously show a high number of human rights violations by Russian soldiers against civilians, including here elderly people, women and children. In Afghanistan, women and girls have become subject to systematic gender-based discrimination and grave human rights violations. The Taliban have issued over 50 decrees with the explicit aim of erasing women from public life. The drastic restriction of their human rights and the impact it is having on their lives clearly show that women and girls in Afghanistan are living under a gender apartheid system. Mr. Chair, for Albania, human rights are and should be used as a valuable set of tools for conflict prevention, peace building and sustaining peace. Human rights information should play a greater role in our common efforts to develop effective early warning mechanisms and early responsibilities. Early action in massive human rights violations needs to be taken seriously. Albania sees the three pillars, peace and security, human rights and development, as interlinked to each other. No peace without development and no development without peace. Mr. Chair, Albania will work tirelessly to tackle all forms of discrimination, including on grounds of sex, race, ethnic or social origin, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, disability, age, sexual orientation and gender identity. Advocacy for human rights would be meaningless without the participation of women and girls. Albania will pay special attention to the women rights and gender equality in line with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the Agenda 2030. We will continue to speak out loudly and clearly against those templing human rights. We must better protect human rights defenders and ensure their voices are being heard, including civil society. We strongly support all efforts to stop, prevent, and ensure accountability for acts of intimidation or reprisals against those who seek to engage with the United Nations. Grave violation against children continue to be perpetrated on a large scale in most countries affected by war. We need to take concrete and decisive action to improve the situation of children worldwide. We need to adopt a human rights-based approach that puts the child at the center and filters analysis through the lens of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Mr. Chair, we need to use the moment to reflect on ways how to improve the human rights system and make it stronger, how to build more resilient societies, how to build accessible and effective educational systems, how to develop responsive social protection and health system, able to provide services to all members of our societies, especially in times of crisis. While we can discuss on the best ways to achieve this, one thing is certain. We need to work together to address our common challenges. No country, no matter how big or powerful, can address alone the complex challenges we are facing today. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Albania and give the floor to Ghana. I thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me the floor. Ghana thanks the Secretary General for his comprehensive report under this agenda item and takes note of the recommendations contained therein. Mr. Chair, the promotion and protection of human rights is no doubt instrumental to our development and the realization of the sustainable development goals. While acknowledging the efforts made in advancing fundamental human rights, including the monitoring of compliance of human rights treaties, as well as through education and awareness campaigns, challenges nonetheless remain. We continue to witness across the world various forms of violations, including hate speech, exploitation of women and youth both online and offline coupled with institutional challenges such as heavy case loads and insufficient financial and human resources these challenges as well as weak state response result in delays in administering justice and permits new forms of criminality we must therefore prioritize measures aimed at strengthening national institutions while also enhancing cooperation at the regional and international levels we would want to emphasize in this context the following four points. First, we believe that the various human rights treaty bodies and conventions, such as the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, remain indispensable in upholding universal human rights. We therefore continue the we therefore welcome the provision of more funding and logistical support to enhance the effectiveness of the work of these critical human rights treaty bodies and related mechanisms. Equally important is the need for all stakeholders, including member states, to adhere to their obligations under these global instruments to help in addressing the menace. Secondly, 
we need to prioritize interventions that will strengthen national institutions at the forefront of championing the crusade against human rights violations. The provision of technical, logistical, and capacity building support to member states is essential. We acknowledge the activities undertaken by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as the UNDP and other UN agencies, funds and programs in support of national human rights institutions and encourage more of such efforts. Thirdly, the evolving nature of human rights in the 21st century, including online exploitation and abuses, require all of us to embrace state-of-the-art technologies to help curb the manage and enhance cybersecurity. Investments in cybersecurity infrastructure to enhance the monitoring, investigation, and arrest of perpetrators of human rights violations online would be critical to assure the protection of human rights. The ongoing negotiations to develop a global convention on countering the use of ICT for criminal purposes provides us with a unique opportunity to address these emerging challenges. Fourthly, it is essential to prioritize measures that would enhance regional and sub-regional mechanisms in advancing human rights. These regional mechanisms, such as the AU Charter on Human and People's Rights, are homegrown approaches that complement global efforts in addressing human rights issues in a comprehensive manner and should be encouraged. Mr. Chair, at the national level, the government of Ghana remains resolute in her commitment to upholding the human rights of all as contained in our Fourth Republic Constitution of 1992, which provides safeguards for human rights and establishes clear pathways for inclusive governance and sustainable development for all peoples of Ghana without discrimination. National human rights institutions such as the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice and the National Commission for Civic Education also play a critical role through educational and capacity building programs aimed at reinforcing the administration of justice. In conclusion, I wish to reaffirm Ghana's commitment to advancing the human rights of all. It is in this context that we thank all member states for their support to us last week in the General Assembly to serve on the Human Rights Council for the term 2024 to 2026. We believe that continuously providing logistical capacity building and funding support to strengthen national human rights institutions, as well as enhancing cooperation with regional arrangements and multilateral instruments, remains the best way forward to uphold human rights and ensure no one is left behind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Ghana. I give the floor to Brunei Dar es Salaam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the outset, Brunei Dar es Salaam aligns itself with a statement delivered by Malaysia on behalf of ASEAN. Mr. Chair, over the past few years, our global community has faced unprecedented challenges such as health pandemics as well as economic disruption. While the world grappled with the physical toll of COVID-19, we must not overlook the profound impact it has had on the global population's mental well-being. In this regard, it is crucial to highlight the World Health Organization's initiatives in addressing this issue, and the emphasis on mental health services being an integral part of every country's response to the pandemic. Based on the WHO's latest available data, depression and anxiety disorders affect more than 250 million glo people globally. Moreover, this disruption caused by the pandemic has resulted in increased rates of stress, burnout, and even suicide in some regions. It is estimated that the prevalence of anxiety and depression may have increased by more than 25% during the first year of the pandemic. But these numbers do not define us. Instead, they ignite our commitment to bring about change. Therefore, it is imperative that we continue to promote mental health awareness and action and subsequently fulfill the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of mental health. Mr. Chair, in Brunei Dar es Salaam, the government recognizes mental health as an integral part of health and well-being as well as a significant determinant of quality of life that must be promoted by all levels of society. Non-communicable diseases are also a burden that Brunei is facing and will continue to face, which in turn also has ramifications on mental health burden and health system response. This has further accentuated the gaps and challenges faced by both the public and health system. Therefore, to combat these mental health challenges, 
the government of Brunei has adopted a comprehensive approach at the end of 2022 by launching the Brunei Darussalam Mental Health Action Plan 2022-25. The plan highlighted a holistic mental health agenda to ensure good health and mental well-being for all as the frequency of depression, anxiety, and stress has increased since the outset of the pandemic. It further aims to strengthen mental health systems, policies, and programs in a more coordinated, structured, and cohesive manner involving stakeholders from both health and non-health sectors while simultaneously ensuring efforts to end stigma, fear, and discrimination surrounding mental health. The plan is also hoped to be a guide for comprehensive, integrated, and responsive mental health services, and to give support at all levels, as well as across multi-sectors by addressing the gaps, in order to ensure that the rights of the mentally ill is valued, protected, and promoted. This is in line with Brunei's national vision, Wawasan Brunei 2035, as well as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 3, particularly Target 3.4, and the WHO Mental Health Action Plan 2013 to 2030 in promoting mental health and well-being. Mr. Chair, last week, the global community came together to commemorate the Mental Health Day, uniting behind the theme mental health is a universal human right. This was also celebrated in Brunei across all sectors of our society, from governmental bodies to NGOs. Nationwide activities were organized, including a series of mental health symposiums, not only to raise awareness and expand knowledge, but also drive actions among our people towards promoting and protecting mental health as a universal human right. We also launched a national round-the-clock hotline operated by mental health advisors, underscoring our commitment to this critical issue. Going forward, Brunei Darussalam will continue to promote regional and international collaboration on mental health, particularly through ASEAN-led mechanisms. And as a member of the international community, we will remain committed to the values and principles of the UN in our collective efforts to advance the well-being of our people and ensuring that no one is left behind. In readying ourselves to face any challenges that come our way, it is imperative to build a resilient and mentally healthy nation. Echoing our health minister's words, there is no health without mental health. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Brunei Dar es Salaam and give the floor to Japan. Mr. Chair, Japan is deeply concerned about the continuing serious human rights and humanitarian situations in many parts of the world. The recent terror attacks by Hamas and other Palestinian militants, especially attacks and kidnapping, uh, kidnappings of innocent civilians, cannot be justified for any reason. Japan firmly condemns such attacks and demands the early release of the hostages. At the same time, yesterday, Al Ahali Hospital in Gaza City was attacked with numerous casualties, and we feel strong indignation on the tremendous damage to innocent civilians. Attacks against hospitals or civilians cannot be justified, uh, on, justified on any ground. It is crucial to minimize the deterioration of humanitarian conditions in, in the Gaza Strip and to ensure humanitarian access in the area. Yesterday, Foreign Minister uh, <coughs> Kamikawa announced that Japan will provide emergency humanitarian aid of 10 million U.S. dollars in total for citizens in the Gaza Strip through international organizations. It is extremely regrettable that Russia's aggression against Ukraine continues even today. A new unilateral attempt to ten change the status quo by the use of force is not acceptable anywhere in the world. Japan strongly urges Russia to end its violation of the UN Charter and human rights immediately. As for Myanmar, we are concerned about the further deterioration of the humanitarian situation as indicated by various reports such as by IIMM and OCHA. We strongly urge again the Myanmar military to make sincere efforts for the peaceful resolution of the situation by taking concrete actions to immediately stop the violence, release those who are detained, and swiftly restore Myanmar's democratic political system. We are also concerned about the incident in Kachin State on October 9th, which resulted in the deaths and injuries of dozens of civilians, including internally displaced persons. Japan condemns all forms of violence. We are also concerned about the lack of improvement in the human rights situation in Afghanistan. 
particularly the restrictions imposed on the rights of women and girls. Japan once again strongly urges the Taliban to immediately withdraw all measures that restrict the enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms for women and girls, including freedom of education, expression, and employment. Japan also expresses its heartfelt condolences uh, to the victims' uh, bereaved families of the earthquake that struck Western Afghanistan on October 7th. We are providing emergency relief goods through emergency grant aid of 3 million U.S. dollars in response to the damage caused by the earthquake. Mr. Chair, more than a year has passed since the OHCHR released an assessment of human rights concerns in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. Japan remains seriously concerned about the human rights situation in the region. We believe it is important that freedom, respect for fundamental human rights and the rule of law, which are universal values in the international community, be guaranteed in this region, Tibet and Hong Kong as well. We continue to strongly urge China to take additional constructive and concrete uh, steps, including enhancing transparency. Last but not least, uh, the abductions of Japanese nationals by North Korea is a serious issue that affects the sovereignty of Japan and the lives and safety of its people and is a universal issue for the entire international community as a violation of hu fundamental human rights. The families of the abductees are aging and there is no time uh, to waste. We strongly urge North Korea to realize the immediate return of all the abductees to Japan and hope for the continued understanding and cooperation of the international community on this issue. Mr. Chair, as the international community is facing multiple crises and increasingly being divided, universal values such as human rights, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law should be respected by all member states. Furthermore, despite the differences in approaches to achieving these values, uh, the Protection of human rights in a balanced manner is a fundamental responsibility to, of all nations. With this in mind and based on the principles of dialogue and cooperation, Japan will play its active role in realizing an international community where human dignity is respected in close coordination and cooperation with member states, uh, international organizations and civil society. We will continue our efforts to protect and promote human rights, particularly in the areas of women's empowerment and gender equality, children's rights, the rights of persons with disabilities, and business and human rights. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Japan. I give the floor to Togo. Microphone Togo, please. It should work now. Okay. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Chair, this is my first time that I, I take the floor in this August Assembly. I would like to therefore convey to you my heartfelt congratulations on being elected to head this important committee. Please allow me to also congratulate uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights on the clarity of his report. Mr. Chair, um, in the year of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Togo, my country, would like to reiterate here its firm commitment to promote and protect uh, human rights in line with numerous international instruments on this and to which we acceded. Therefore, the government of Togo has continued working tirelessly over the years so as to adopt policies and other measures so as to implement the provisions of these instruments. Establishing various national institutions on the issue of human rights, the National Commission, for example, on Human Rights in 1987, which is one of the national institutions according to our constitution, is an example, a ministry on human rights in our constitution of 1992. Uh, such examples of our firm will to promote and protect human rights in my country. Mr. Chair, 
take into account the universality, indivisibility, and interconnectedness of own human rights, the action of the government of Toko has always been in to promote democracy and the rule of law, but also and especially towards a strengthening governance and socioeconomic development. Togo, therefore, for some years now, has uh, been in enhancing its work so as to improve the social protection regime. And this is given the various crises and shocks, including the COVID-19 pandemic. We're doing this so as to increase resilience. We, during the COVID-19, we put together a monetary transfer system for the benefit of those who work in the informal sector. And we're thus trying to mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic on the um, fragile population. The new mechanism so as to promote and guarantee employment. And this is expressed in a training institution for development. And more frequently, the universal health insurance in one of our laws. And this was passed in October 2021 as we were uh, implementing this commitment of ours. And this is a very firm commitment on the part of the government of Co Togo to fight poverty and social inequality and to promote and protect socio-economic rights of all of our citizens. I thank you, sir. I thank the distinguished representative of Togo and give the floor to Tunisia. Shukran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Human rights represent one of the most important pillars of our policy, whether internal policy or foreign policy, and it is the key core of all programs and strategies on the national level aiming to empower women, youth, children, elderly, persons of determination, and other categories. We are also keen on migration and keen on international commitments with regards to all we have mentioned. Mr. Chair. Stemming from our commitment to the human rights machinery and our total rejection of all forms of aggression or violation to international community, I will not speak too much on our commitments and our achievements in that regard. We have seen terrible circumstances that the whole world is facing. This culminated in the most brutal of actions yesterday. I will dedicate this intervention to our fellow brothers and sisters in Palestine keen on their right to the land and those who have paid the price of defending their rights with their lives. We are now discussing reports on human rights under the auspices of the United Nations. The UN Charter, our reference, is built on four pillars which are peace and security, human rights, rule of law and development. Therefore, we must condemn in the harshest of terms what the Israeli occupation forces is committing in terms of violations against Palestinians in their occupied lands. They have continued in flagrant violation of the right to life and all pillars of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, along with all humanitarian international instruments. The occupation forces have added to their long line of aggressive policies an attack on a civilian hospital in Gaza, leaving behind hundreds of innocent civilians and medical and paramedical personnel and women and children and others. This crime is but one stop on its path of closing passages and deprivation of the most basic needs for life. Therefore, how can we talk about human rights in light of all these continued violations with total impunity and with no deterrence? These violations are continuing with total recklessness and violation of legal obligations. How many children in Palestine must die for the world to break its silence and put an end to these massacres? 
people have rights. These rights are indivisible and cannot be subject to double standards. The children of Palestine as well have rights as per the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, which demands for them to have a proper living standard and leisure and play and psychological security and peace. The situation in Palestine now puts us all to a true test as to the level to which we truly respect international human rights law and international humanitarian law. We have many times heard in this committee speeches about condemnation of human rights violations in other states, and we were looking forward to seeing that same enthusiasm and commitment towards the current situation. Tunisia will continue to hold steadfastly onto the UN Charter and the principles of multilateral action which necessitate cooperation among all states on the basis of non-discrimination, non-politicization, and open dialogue constructively among all member states on the basis of equality. We emphasize that all forms of terrorism must be condemned without being linked to any specific nationality or religion or culture or civilization in any state of the world. And we once more reaffirm the basic obligations of member states in countering terrorism as per the UN Charter and international law. We hope that the international community will take action and to immediately intervene in the name of human rights to end the shelling and to end collective punishment and the deprivation of medical and food supplies and humanitarian supplies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Tunisia and give the floor to Tajikistan. Mr. Chair, my delegation aligns itself with the statement de delivered by distinguished representative of Egypt on behalf of OIC Group. Tajikistan strongly condemns the bombing of Palestine, Palestinian Al-Ahli Baptism Hospital, which caused the death and injuries of many people, including children and women. Civilian facilities, especially hosp hospitals, should not be attacked under any circumstances and should be safe place to serve the population under all conditions. My delegation expresses condolences to the relatives and killed Wish, and wish for a full recovery to injured and strongly condemns the acts of violence and calls on the all parties to an immediate ceasefire and start dialogue in order to stabilize the situation. Mr. Chair, promotion and protection of human rights are one, are one of our priorities. Tajikistan has acceded to a number of international human rights instruments since, it's, since gaining its independence. Legislation of the country guarantees fundamental rights and freedoms of, hum, uh, freedom of citizens. The government and state bodies of Tajikistan are gradually taking necessary measures to implement the norms relating to the human rights. In Tajikistan, a person and his freedoms are considered the highest value and are and under protection of the state. We have taken concrete measures to strengthen and protect human rights, including rights of children, prevention, of, prevention and elimination of discrimination against women, the rights of persons with disabilities, prevention and punishment of torture and other inhuman and disgrading treatment. In Tajikistan, in this regard, Tajikistan pays special attention to strengthening international cooperation on human rights in the framework of the UN and other international and regional organizations. In addition, Tajikistan fulfills its obligation on the basis of the international mechanism for protection of human rights, including submission of UPR to the Human Rights Council. During the period of from 2010 to 2022, the country submitted UPR three times and submitted the reports to the UN treaty bodies. At the invitation of the government, 11 special procedures mandate holders visited Tajikistan and provided recommendations. Since 2013, 20 national action plans 
have been adopted to, to implement the recommendation of the UN treaty bodies. Tajikistan sub submitted its combined 12th and 30, 13th periodic report to the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination earlier this year. Constitution of Tajikistan guarantees the enjoyment of rights of rights and freedom for all, regardless of nationality, race, sex, language, religion, political beliefs, education, or social status, and countries' legal framework prohibits all forms of discrimination. The Act on Equality and Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination adopted in 2022 defined the legal basis for safeguarding equal rights of equal rights and opportunities for all persons and establish a legal system for prevention and protection against discrimination. Mr. Chair, on, uh, on August 5, 2023, we adopted a national strategy in the field of human rights, human rights protection for the period up to 2038. The strategy was developed and adopted, taking into account international standards in the field of human rights recommendation of, uh, of UN agencies as well as sustainable development goals. This strategy incorporates all existing national plans related to the implementation of recommendation of UN human rights institution and other human rights related documents and improves the mechanism and procedures for the implementation of international obligation in the field of human rights. Tajikistan is committed to upholding human rights standards as outlined in the international treaties and agreements. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Tajikistan and give the floor to the state of Palestine. For 11 days now, the world has watching a member state of this organization brutally assaulting my people in the Gaza Strip. In 11 days, Israel killed more than 3,000 Palestinians, including 1,000 children, and injured many more, half of them women and children, by airstrikes directly hitting their homes. Israel has not spared a single Palestinian family in Gaza. Those who were not killed are injured. Those who are not injured are displaced. And those had thought found a safe haven in Al Ahli Hospital was massacred. Does this make Israel feel more secure now? Does this fulfill the need for unconditional support to Israel? According to the UN, families in Gaza have been bombed by Israel while in their homes or on their way in search for a safe place along damaged roads following an Israeli evacuation order that left hundreds of thousands of people scrambling for safety, but with nowhere safe to go. Israel resorted to unlawful collective punishment as a method of war, intentionally cutting fuel, water, and electricity of Gaza, and blocking the entry of a humanitarian aid. Entire residential neighborhoods have been razed to the ground, homes, schools, UN facilities, health centers, hit by direct and intense Israeli airstrikes. Aid workers have been targeted and killed. Rescue teams are struggling to carry out their missions amid continuous airstrikes. Severe sh shortage of equipment and limited or with no connection to mobile networks. There's no power, no water, no fuel. Food supplies are running dangerously low. Hospitals, overwhelmed with patients and injured, are running out of medicine. Morgues are, off, are overflowing with bodies. Bodies are buried in mass graves. Israel ordered 22 hospitals in Gaza to evacuate, an order that WHO labeled as a death sentence for the sick and injured. This includes newborn babies in incubators. Mr. Chair, two million Palestinian people live in Gaza. Half of them are children, 
but Israel is dropping exclusive explosives as no civilian live there and acting like everyone in Gaza deserve to be killed. The mass killing of civilians and the scale of destruction do not at all indicate a so-called collateral damage, but rather indiscriminate attacks against civilians. What is this if not barbaric and brutal? Whitewashing Israel crimes in advance by proclaiming that Israel is not responsible for the killing of Palestinian civilians is inhumane and irresponsible, and it undermines the most fundamental rules of our international law-based order. Those doing the killings are responsible for it. We call on you to stand against Israel's crimes, to stop the massacres against my people, to stop the epic human suffering, and to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, one thing, only one thing that deserves your unconditional support, justice, not vengeance. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the State of Palestine. I give the floor to Bolivia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Chair. My solidarity goes to the speaker who just spoke. My delegation wishes to endorse the statements made by the group of friends in defense of the UN Charter and another group. In my national capacity, we have the following to state. Sir, I could not begin without condemning the atrocious genocide being uh, conducted against Palestinians in Gaza at this very moment. As we speak, children, women, older persons, all, all Palestinians are suffering the greatest injustice and worst human rights violations. This people has been deprived of the most basic uh, services such as access to food, medication, uh, this is inconceivable. They wait desperately for urgent actions by the international community, meanwhile. Chair, today as we gather at the 75th anniversary of the Human Rights Declaration and on the anniversary of the Vienna Declaration, we take stock of the constant uh, development of international human rights law, of human rights as a tool that enables us to call upon the international community to work jointly to tackle our joint challenges, especially in gathering uh, the tools needed for access to justice. Bolivia promotes universality, interdependence, indivisibility of all rights. Likewise, as a member of the Human Rights uh, Council, we are committed to the development of the case law of the Council. In this context, we highlight the, the adoption of various resolutions in the recent uh, session in Geneva of, of the HRC and also uh, we, we note the work of the group of uh, farmers and others, a proposal by Bolivia. On, uh, we endeavor for the in promotion and protection of uh, human rights, and also the, there is a resolution on the right to development and other resolutions that we uh, led. My country endeavors for the promotion and protection of all human rights. We especially highlight the focus of the rights to, uh, of children and adolescents. Those are among our highest priorities, as 35% of our population is aged under 18. In this respect, we welcome the general comment 26 of this year, a general comment on the rights of the child and the environment with special attention to climate change. Likewise, we wish to highlight the general comment 39 on the rights of women and indigenous girls 
This provides important guidelines for states in implementing the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We welcome that this was uh, translated into indigenous languages. We also wish to note our commitment uh, to the rights of indigenous women's, women throughout the regions. We are concerned about the high levels of violence that they are subjected to and that this is uh, being normalized. We believe it is vital to recognize women's contribution to development and to the well-being of our society. That requires greater protection and promotion of their rights, for example, through access to quality education as a transformative tool uh, social, socially, and also to tackle the barriers they face to access to comprehensive education on sexual and reproductive rights. Sir. Well, we wish to reiterate our support to the work in favor of Afro-descendant peoples. We recognize the important role of the Permanent Forum in that regard. In the 21st century, uh, there is the right for all to live in dignity, such that we cannot face the same obstacles as before. It is vital that the international community act with urgency, given current uh, circumstances. Thank you very much. I thank the distinguished representative of Bolivia and give the floor to Mozambique. Mr. Chair, Mozambique aligns itself with the statement delivered by distinguished representative of Angola on behalf of the Portuguese speaking countries as well as on behalf of Southern countries. As we celebrate this year, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 38th anniversary of the Vienna World Convention on Human Rights, we express our full support to the conclusions and recommendations outlined in the report of the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Development, proposing initiatives to minimize the adverse impacts of today's global challenges and business activities on these important human rights. Against the back backdrop of multiple and unprecedented crises, such as the continued negative impacts of climate change, extreme natural disasters, and unstable global economic trends, and food insecurity, terrorism, and violent extremism, realizing the right to development is crucial to ensure the realization of all other human rights. It is also essential to the full implementation of sustainable development goals, and notably, to deliver on the promise of leaving no one behind. While we acknowledge the global strides in promoting social inclusion, gender inequality remains a major hurdle. The right to development is threatened by the persistent social exclusion and discrimination against women and girls whose rights continue to be seriously violated. This highlights the imperative to address the underlying factors preventing these social groups from benefiting from the right to development and consequently from the enjoyment of human rights. Mr. Chair, taking the right to development as a comprehensive economic, social, cultural and political process that aims at constant improvement of the well-being of the entire population and individuals, Mozambique promotes and values the involvement of women in the development process and encourages their active role in all spheres of the society life as enshrined in the Constitution of the Republic. In this regard, the government developed and put in place different instruments with emphasis on the gender policy and strategy for its implementation, the National Action Plan for Advancement of Women, the Law on Domestic Violence Perpetrated Against Women, the Multi-Sector multi Mechanism for Integrated Assistance to women victims of violence and the law to prevent and combat early marriages. Mozambique underscores the right to development as, a, as an inalienable human right by virtue of which every human person, as well as public and private entities, including the business sector, are entitled to participate in, contribute to, and enjoy economic, social, cultural, and political development. We concur on the urgency of reviewing negative business practices, particularly those that promote social inequalities and discrimination by adopting 
initiatives that can contribute to political development by facilitating access to safe and affordable technologies to help people without any discrimination and allocating resources for the full implementation of the right to development, which stands as a vital framework for the promotion and protection of the right to development. To conclude, Chairperson, Mozambique reiterates its unaware commitment to continue promoting and protecting human rights, considering relevant domestic and international laws. I thank you for your attention. I thank the distinguished representative of Mozambique and give the floor to Turkey. Microphone for Turkey, please. Maybe you can press. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Creating a world where all individuals can live lives worthy of their inherent dignity free from human rights violations requires not only the endeavors of individual countries, but the collective will and concerted action of the entire international community. Building on the action plan on human rights launched in March 2021 and successfully implemented in the subsequent period, we have recently initiated the process for preparing a new action plan on human rights for the period 2024-2028. Turkey maintains a constructive cooperation with the relevant UN mechanisms. Last year, we have submitted our second periodic review to the Human Rights Committee. Mr. Chair, we remain deeply concerned about the rise of xenophobia, racism, and Islamophobia in the world. We have a shared responsibility to promote mutual understanding and peaceful coexistence. Turkey will continue to take part in international efforts to combat intolerance and discrimination based on religion. We all know that fear strokes hatred towards the other. Governments should not aggravate these fears. Mr. Chair, we are deeply concerned about the ongoing violence in Israel and Palestine. We strongly condemn the loss of civilian lives and call on, on all parties for de-escalation. We reiterate our call for restraint and avoidance of any actions that might worsen the situation in the region. Indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure in Gaza are unacceptable. International humanitarian law and international human rights law must be respected under all circumstances. An immediate ceasefire is urgently needed. International community must step in to facilitate delivery of humanitarian aid. On Ukraine, Turkey's position has been clear and constant from the outset. We remain committed to Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the protection of the civilian population. The situation of the Crimean Tatar Turks, the indigenous people of Crimea, remains a priority. Turkey will continue to support the rights of the Crimean Tatar kinsmen to preserve their identity and to live in their historical homeland in peace and safety. The protection of the rights and freedoms of the Uyghur Turks and other Muslim minorities in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region remains to be an important issue on the basis of China's territorial integrity and sovereignty. We will continue to be engaged in this regard. Human rights violations in Myanmar, including crimes against Rohingya, remain a source of serious concern. The necessary steps to restore democracy should be taken without delay. The conditions of the Rohingya living in Myanmar must be improved and the efforts for a viable solution to the Rohingya crisis be continued. We are deeply concerned by the increasing erosion of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms in Afghanistan, in particular for women and girls who have been imposed severe restrictions. The fundamental rights of all Afghans, including the right to education, should be fully respected. Recent earthquakes in Herat once again demonstrated fragility of the precarious humanitarian situation in the country. Turkey will continue to stand by the Afghan people to respond to their humanitarian needs and calls for global efforts towards this end. Millions of Syrians are deprived of their most fundamental human rights as a result of the conflict that has been going on for 12 years in Syria. We call on the Syrian regime to continue to genuinely engage in the political process in line with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2254. We also urge the international community not to turn a blind eye to the human rights violations of all terrorist organizations, first and foremost, PKK, PYD, and their affiliates operating inside Syria. Mr. Chair, it is only by respecting and promoting human rights that we can have sustainable, diverse, and peaceful societies. As we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we reiterate our commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights at the national, regional, and international levels, and ready to contribute all efforts towards this end. I thank you. 
I thank the distinguished representative of Turkey and give the floor to Germany. Thank you, Mr. P uh, Chair. Germany aligns itself with the EU statement. As we mark the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we reaffirm our commitment to the universality, indivisibility, and interdependence of human rights as fundamental and inalienable rights of all people, regardless of their gender, sexual orientation, race, origin, religion, or any other status. War and aggression continue to be among the greatest threats to fundamental guarantees of human rights and the principles of the UN Charter. We join others in condemning the indiscriminate attacks by Hamas across Israel in the strongest possible terms and reiterate Israel's right to self-defense in line with the UN Charter. We are horrified by yesterday's blast killing hundreds of innocent civilians of Al Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza. Civilian targets, notably a fully operational hospital with patients and health personnel, must not be attacked by anyone under any circumstances, civilians must be protected with full respect to international humanitarian law. Safe and unimpeded humanitarian access must be ensured. We equally condemn Russia's continued war of aggression against Ukraine and the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed. International crimes against the civilian population, including thousands of children, must be accounted for. Mr. Chair, Germany's unwavering commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights includes protecting civil and political rights. We believe that the respect for individual freedoms, such as the freedom of expression, assembly, and association, are crucial in creating strong and resilient societies. Therefore, the protection of human rights defenders from repression and reprisal is of key importance. Acts of repression in violation of human rights cannot be considered as internal matters of sovereignty as they affect internal, international obligations and because their effects transcend borders. Germany places equal importance on social, economic, and cultural rights. We are a leading contributor in the field of development cooperation and we remain dedicated to redoubling our efforts to achieve the Agenda 2030 goals. In the same way, Wayne, we are proud this year to be co-facilitating co the resolution on the human rights to water and sanitation together with Spain, as well as the resolution on national human rights institutions. Germany recognizes overall the pivotal role of gender equality in ensuring the full enjoyment of human rights by women and girls in all their, their diversity. We are committed to advancing gender equality both domestically and as an, as an integral part of our feminist foreign policy globally. Mr. Chair, <coughs> Germany firmly believes in the inherent dignity and equality of all individuals irrespective of their race, ethnicity, or, origi or origin. Racism is not only a blatant contradiction to human rights, it also un uh, undermines the stability of societies and must therefore be eradicated. Mr. Chair, Germany is acutely aware of the historical and moral responsibility associated with past injustices. This includes the restitution of cultural goods. We acknowledge the importance of restitution as an integral part of respecting the cultural heritage and rights of affected communities. Specifically, Germany is committed to engaging in a constructive dialogue and cooperation with countries and communities seeking the return of cultural artifacts such as the Benin bronzes to Nigeria. We recognize the cultural, historical, and symbolic value of these artifacts to their countries of origin. Germany underscores the importance of fostering international collaboration and ethical practices in the management of cultural, her cultural heritage, promoting a shared commitment to preserving the diversity and richness of the world's cultural legacy. Germany remains determined to make its contribution towards a fair, and just resolution that respects the rights and aspirations of all parties involved. To conclude, Mr. Chair, and as the uh, recently reappointed co-facilitator for the preparatory process of the Summit of the Future, I look forward to working with all member states as we make sure that the realization of the human rights of all will be taken into account in the relevant chapters of the Pact for the Future. And let me underscore my personal and Germany's conviction that young people need to be meaningfully involved and take a visible role uh, in the summit of the future and beyond. I thank you, Chair. I thank the distinguished representative of Germany and give the floor to Ecuador. 
Estamos horrorizados. We are horrified by the reports of destruction of the of the hospital in Gaza. It was destroyed. Hundreds were killed, murdered. Hospitals must be sanctuaries to preserve human life and not scenes of death and destruction. Not respecting IHL. Respecting IHL is an imperative of the international community. Sir, my delegation welcomes the information provided by the special rapporteurs on the various themes under item 71 on the promotion and protection of human rights. In November 2022, we presented our fourth UPR with three voluntary commitments an institutional framework for the national plan for the presentation of, a, of reports, uh, the creation of a ministry for women, uh, and the per, uh, respect for the human rights of persons. All of these have been uh, fulfilled this year. In January of this year, the High Commissioner visited Ecuador and highlighted Ecuador's commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights. And Ecuador, through specific actions, promotes the strengthening of multilateralism in the way it addresses human rights. That is why we were a member of the Human Rights Council on three occasions. This body, we hope to return to this in 2027 through 2029. There is a clear link between sustainable development and the 2030 Agenda and human rights. The international community has the re collective responsibility to do its utmost to ensure this is upheld. In this respect, we seek to implement the recommendations of the Special Rapporteur's uh, reports and of various and human rights mechanisms, including for the eradication of poverty, on dealing with malnutrition and gender-based violence, uh, reducing gaps in health, uh, tackling education, and also climate change impacts, and hence ensuring that no one is left behind. At the local level, we are working with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in implementing various projects to prevent and protect human rights. We take note of the recommendations of the report on the need to strengthen some areas, such as for greater participation of civil society to adopt measures to ensure gender equality and empowerment of women, to tackle inequalities and deep-rooted causes of discrimination. Sir, distinguished colleagues, Ecuador, aware of its responsibility to the international community, uh, has measures for safe, orderly, regular migration and responsible migration respecting the rights of persons in a situation of human mobility, tackling uh, networks of an illicit trafficking of migrants. We are a country that uh, deals with all the facets of migration. We are a country of destination, origin, and return. We are the country in Latin America and the Caribbean with the greatest number of persons recognized officially as refugees, more than 70 5,000 since 1989, with more than 80 nationalities, and they receive the same treatment as Ecuadorans. We know that the principles of solidarity and protection of human rights, this can be included successfully in public policy on the basis of cooperation and with support of the international community. Chair. We are aware that there is no human rights paradise. We are undertaking efforts to t tackle the, our challenges. That is why, as we are months from celebrating the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we reiterate here our unequivocal commitment to respecting, promoting, and protecting human rights of all persons. Thank you very much.
thank the distinguished representative of Ecuador and give the floor to Indonesia. Mr. Chairperson, Indonesia aligns itself with the statement made by ASEAN and OIC. At the very outset, let me express Indonesia's unwavering and resolute commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights. We stand at a pivotal juncture in history, both as a nation and as a part of the global community. We mark the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark document that remains a testament to our collective aspiration for dignity, freedom, and equality. Yet, as we reflect upon its ethos, we cannot turn a blind eye to the present state of our world. It is a world that is confronted with increasingly complex and pressing challenges to human rights. First, Indonesia stands in firm solidarity with the Palestinian people. The dire situation in Gaza Strip stands as a harrowing testament. We condemn the implementation of collective punishment policy by the occupying power in Gaza and the recent horrifying attacks targeting civilians' facilities, including hospitals, have resulted in a tragic loss of at least 500 lives with countless others injured. Such acts not only go against every grain of humanity but also defy the very essence of the UDHR. Indonesia calls for an urgent immediate ceasefire and ensure that humanitarian aid reaches those in dire need. The sufferings of innocent civilians, children and women must cease. Second, in a regional level, we advance ASEAN human rights dialogue with a significant leader's declaration. This declaration serves as a dynamic platform for dialogue on thematic human rights issues. We as the ASEAN member states commit to fostering dialogue, sharing our progress, and addressing the challenges that lie ahead. This is our collective pledge to enhance cooperation for the enduring promotion and protection of human rights. Third, domestically, Indonesia remains equally resolute in its commitment. Having concluded our fourth cycle of the Universal Periodic Review, we are proud to state that we have ratified all eight core instruments of human rights. Currently, Indonesia is an advanced in, in an advanced process of ratifying the Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. One significant milestone towards acknowledging historical injustices and fostering reconciliation when Indonesia's president acknowledged 12 past rights violations early this year. In a decisive move, we instituted President's, President's Decree No. 4, Year 2003, forging a committee to robustly oversee non-judicial settlements and fortify the judicial process. This signifies a proactive stance towards preventing future human rights violations. Mr. Chairperson, in conclusion, while we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, it is imperative to recognize that its words need to translate into tangible actions. The UDHR cannot merely remain a written testament. It calls for regional embodiment and demands concrete actions at the domestic level. The true measure of our commitment lies not in the declarations we make, but in the steps we take. Believe in Indonesia's unwavering commitment. Believe in our relentless pursuit of a world where human rights are not just upheld, but celebrated. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Indonesia and give the floor to Estonia. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, Estonia aligns itself with a statement made by the European Union and would like to add the following. Estonia is deeply worried about the deteriorating human rights situation in many parts of the world, including Afghanistan, Sudan, Syria, Iran, and Myanmar. We follow the developments in the Middle East with great concern. Estonia strongly condemns the brutal attacks by the terrorist organization Hamas against Israel, which has resulted in the destruction and loss of civilian lives. We call for the immediate release of all hostages. Meanwhile, the solving, solving of this crisis must be fully in line with international humanitarian law. 
the protection of civilians should be imperative. And I underline, the protection of civilians should be imperative. Mr. Chair, Russia's horrendous full-scale war of aggression against Ukraine started nearly two years ago. Since then, the people of Ukraine have, have been the subject to severe violation of international law by Russia, and severe breach of the UN Charter is evident. In September 2022, the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine confirmed evidence of war crimes committed by Russian armed forces. This involves systematic and widespread use of attacks harming civilians, torture, sexual and gender-based violence, and grave violations against children. In March, the International Criminal Court issued arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin and Maria Lvova Belova for the war crimes uh, of unlawful deportation of children from occupied areas of Ukraine to Russia. Over 19,000 children unlawfully deported or otherwise separated from their parents or guardians have been identified by the Ukrainian government. The real number is certainly higher. Russia was also listed as a party carrying out grave violations against children in the Secretary General's report on children and armed conflict. Schools and hospitals are destroyed, leaving the children of Ukraine deprived of education and health services. Many have lost their parents, their psychological well-being is carried for life, and their childhood has been stolen from them. Estonia supports Ukraine in holding Russian's political and military leadership fully accountable and establishing a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. Meanwhile, Russia's armed forces and affiliated mercenaries must withdraw from the internationally recognized territory of Ukraine and abide by the obligations under international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Mr. Chair, I would further like to draw your attention on the fact that 85% of the global population live in countries where freedom of expression has decreased. Journalists and media workers risk their life while doing their job. At the same time, high levels of impunity remain an urgent challenge and internet shutdowns are becoming more frequent. In the context of advancement of digital technologies, we must acknowledge emerging threats on human rights and ensure that adequate safeguards are developed and set up to protect human rights. Media freedom and internet freedom are increasingly intertwined and international human rights law must also be respected in the digital sphere. Estonia stands firm in protecting human rights online and offline as one of the founding members of both the Media Freedom Coalition and the Freedom Online Coalition. Since, ju since July this year, Estonia is co-chairing the Media Freedom Coalition and we aim to take up this important role also in the Freedom Online Coalition in the near future. Mr. Chair, I would like to affirm that Estonia stands for the equal treatment of LGBTIQ plus persons and the protection and promotion of their rights. We condemn discrimination and violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity. In this regard, Estonia took a step further by legalizing same-sex marriages in June this year. Estonia is also a founding member of the Equal Rights Coalition, currently involving 42 member states who are dedicated protectors of uh, LGBTIQ uh, plus persons' rights. As a liberal de democracy, we want to advance human rights of all people. We stand for ensuring the inclusive development of its rights, since we firmly believe that taking care of the rights of all citizens will make our societies more cohesive, cohesive and prosperous. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Estonia. Colleagues, we've heard the last speaker in the general discussion for this morning. Before we adjourn, I'd like to remind uh, you that the deadline for submission of draft proposals under this item is Tuesday, 31st October at 1 p.m. We will continue consideration of Agenda Item 71, Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, at 3 p.m. this afternoon, and here's statements by the Special Procedures Mandate Holders and other experts, and engage with them in an interactive dialogue. Following the dialogues, the committee will resume the general discussion of the item that we've had so far this morning, and we will also have statements under Rule 115, the right to reply. The meeting is adjourned.